contradict yourself. You see where your pretty reasoning leads you. <laughs> I, I presume thou art in the right, Ben Franklin. Presume? Huh. Unquestionably, I'm in the right. I was in the right in the beginning. I've been in the right all along. I'm always right. Thou hast won the disputation, Ben Franklin. But I won't concede it to thee. Won't concede it, eh? Why, my friend? For thee, why? Because, Ben, thou art not content with being in the right. Thou hast to be overbearing and insolent as well. Good day to thee, sir. Well, I... Good day, Mistress Franklin. Good day. <laughs> Did you win your argument, Benjamin? Uh, eh, eh, what, dear child? I say, did you win the argument with your Quaker friend? Win? Win? Did I win? Ben Franklin, the great American diplomat and philosopher. One of the greatest salesmen that ever lived. He began life an inveterate arguer. But when his Quaker friend drove home the awful truth, Ben took it on the chin and asked himself a few questions. He did some powerful thinking, and he came to the conclusion that you don't win arguments by arguing. But what is more important, Ben did something about it. He decided to correct his faults. He determined to change his method of working with people. He formulated some rules to govern his man-to-man -man relations. Virtue is obtained rather by the use of the ears than of the tongue. Put on the humble inquirer. Argument is productive of disgusts and perhaps enmities. In answering an opinion, observe that in certain cases the opinion would be right. Forbear all direct contradictions to the sentiments of others and all positive assertions. Lose no time, but let each part of your business have its time. They are simple, these rules, but they helped make possible Ben's long and illustrious career of selling America. They helped make Ben one of the most effective salesmen of all time. Now, Ben wasn't what we would call a natural-born salesman. But by applying these rules, he sold the people of Pennsylvania his ideas for clean streets. People weren't attracted to Ben, just the opposite, in fact. But despite this, he sold his ideas for a volunteer fire department and a public library. By nature, Ben didn't have the knack of getting along with people, yet he put over his ideas for a free hospital and state university. Ben was a poor speaker, but he carried his points. He sold America to the French and secured many millions of dollars in loans, loans which made possible the victories of General George Washington. As an old man, Ben went to the Constitutional Convention and sold America on signing the supreme law of the land. Selling America wasn't a hit or miss proposition with Ben. It all came down to the simple rules he established for himself early in life and which he applied throughout the length and breadth of his long selling career. Now this is all very well and good, but the modern salesman says, how do Ben's rules apply to modern selling? What kind of a salesman would Ben make today? Times have changed. Customers today are different. Selling America today isn't like selling America back in the 18th century. You're quite right, sir. Times have changed. The modern customer is different. In dress, in manner of living. The modern tempo is faster. You are quite right, sir. In your selling, you offer services undreamed of in my time. You answer needs that never existed before. 
What you sell America is entirely different, but how you sell it is something else. The methods of influencing people to buy are more or less universal. They are based on human nature, which is perhaps the one thing in all the years that has remained constant. Then you think I can sell, well, refrigerators, ranges, automobile tires, anything at all that's modern, by some of those rules? Indeed I do, sir. Well, Ben, you'll have to show me. That will be a pleasure, sir. All right, Ben. What's your first rule again? My first rule, sir, is virtue is obtained rather by the use of the ears than of the tongue. Uh, put on the humble inquirer. Mm. Which in up-to-date English means get the prospect to talk, ask questions, eh, Ben? Right, sir. But Ben, does that always apply? Isn't it a good idea to let the prospect know that you know what you're selling? Yes, indeed. But there's a time and a place for all that. After you have found out just what you're selling. The salesman who doesn't get the prospect to talk, who doesn't ask questions, is likely to monopolize the conversation and lose the sale because he never does find out the prospect's real reason for not buying. The salesman who uses his tongue rather than his ears, is likely to run into this difficulty. While you're here, Mr. Daniels, if you have time, I'd like to show you our tires. You'll be needing some new ones before long, you know. Yes, I know. Uh, but I generally buy my tires down the street at Ed's place. Well, if it's economy and tires you're looking for, Mr. Daniels, I think I can prove to you that our make of tire comes just as cheap as those down the street. That is, Cheap when you consider the service and long life you get out of our make. Well, Why, I... Mr. Daniels, these tires have been put through all kinds of road tests before they were placed on the market. Scientifically conducted road tests by the greatest engineers in the industry. And they prove conclusively that this tire has the greatest mileage of any tire you can buy today. Just let well, me... Well, I'll think it over and let you know. I have an appointment. Pet selling points are often the reason for lost sales. The salesman tries to sell something that he himself is interested in, and frequently it is not at all what the prospect is interested in. That's why rule number one says, get the prospect to talk. Ask questions. In that way, you can find out what the prospect really wants. How do you find out what his real reasons are for not buying? <laughs> well, the simplest way to do that, I should say, is to ask why. Why? Uh-huh. Let's see how it works on Mr. Daniels. While you're here, Mr. Daniels, if you have time, I'd like to show you our tires. You'll be needing some new ones before long, you know. Yes, I know. But I generally buy my tires down the street at Ed's place. Is that so, Mr. Daniels? Just why do you like that particular tire? Well, I don't know. I've been using them a long time. I like the way they're made. In other words, you like their construction? Well, yes, I guess that's it. I see. Just why do you like that particular construction? Well, I'll tell you. I do a good deal of traveling in all kinds of weather. What I like most about that tire is the tread. Well, I don't want to be too inquisitive, Mr. Daniels, but just what do you like about that tread? Well, it doesn't skid. I see. Well, that's very important in a tire. And I believe you'd be interested in seeing a new safety tread that our company has just developed. A new tread? Yes. I'd like to show it to you. The prospect is really interested in safety, in non-skid. So that's what the salesman must talk about if he wants the prospect to listen. Not cost of the tire, not mileage. All the talk in the world about cost or mileage wouldn't sell that prospect when he's really interested in something else. The only way I could find that out was to ask questions. Besides, if you get people to talk, it puts you on a friendly basis. People like to talk. Okay, Ben. What's your second rule? My second rule is arguments are productive of disgust and perhaps enmities. Persons of good sense seldom fall into them. Mm. That means uh, don't argue, eh, Ben? Right. 
Well, yes, Ben, but isn't it true that there are some people that you just can't help arguing with? Well, I know the kind you mean, but woe to the salesman who gets into debate with them. Watch this. You can't tell me it's cheap to cook with electricity. Somebody else, maybe, but not me. I know all about cooking with it. My sister-in-law used to have an electric range and her bills ran, oh, I don't know how much a month. Well, Mrs. Harrison, your sister-in-law must have had a very poor range. Oh, no, she didn't. She had a very good range, one of the best. It cost, oh, an awful lot of money. It was a good range, all right, one of the best. Then, probably, she didn't know how to cook with didn't it. Didn't know how to cook? What do you know about it? What I meant was, she probably wasted current, used electricity that she didn't need. Why, we've made a national survey why, I have statements here to prove. I guess she knows what she needs to cook with and what she doesn't. My sister-in-law is a good cook. She was chief dietitian of, oh, I don't know how many hospitals before she was married. Cook? Why, that little woman could cook wings around anybody I ever saw. The most beautiful pies and roasts and, well, anybody who says my sister-in-law can't cook is... Well, what do you know about it? What can you cook? Well, I... I bet you can't even boil water. Can't even boil water. <laughs> you men are all alike. You think just because you're men, you know all there is to know about everything. All there is to know. My Harry is just the same, doesn't think a woman knows anything, anything at all, about politics or anything. Well, I want to tell you that the woman in this country counts for something in the government, whether you... <laughs> and if you do get into an argument, there's no telling where it will lead you. But one thing is certain, though, it won't lead to a sale. But how do you handle a woman like that, Ben? Well, that brings me to my next rule, rule number three. In answering an opinion, Observe that in certain cases or circumstances, the opinion would be right. What does that mean, Ben? <laughs> well, as you might put it, it means answer with a yes, but. That's what I'd do with a woman like that one. You can't tell me it's cheap to cook with electricity. Somebody else, maybe, but not me. I know all about cooking with it. My sister-in-law used to have an electric range and her bills ran, oh, I don't know how much a month. Yes, Mrs. Harrison, I can understand why you feel that way. Many people think that about electric cooking costs. Some electric ranges did cost a lot to operate. That's because many of the earlier electric ranges used a lot of current and because rates were high. But fortunately, those conditions are no longer true. I know, but my sister-in-law told me definitely that her range cost her seven dollars a month to operate. Yes, I have no doubt that your sister-in-law's range did cost that much to operate. But today's electric rates are appreciably lower, and the modern range uses considerably less current. Well, it's hard to believe there could be so awful much difference. Yes, it is hard to believe. But as a matter of fact, in a national survey just completed, the average cost of operation was found to be only $2.30 a month. And here are some actual statements from owners right in this town. Well, that certainly is surprising. I had no idea it cost so little to cook with electricity. Of course, you know, my sister-in-law did have quite an old range. Well, Ben, the yes but technique sure pulled you through on that one. What's your next rule? My next rule has to do with the cause of arguments. Many of them you know the salesman himself provokes. That's why I say in rule number four, forbear all direct contradictions to the sentiments of others and all positive assertions. Don't contradict. Don't be too positive. Right. For when you do contradict, when you are too positive, well, Let's see what might happen. Good day, sir. Oh, how do you do? I'm looking for one of those uh, grips. I didn't see what I wanted in the window. One of those, uh, you know, grips. What do you want it for? Well, I'm going to do a little traveling. The company is sending me out in the field again. I'm going on the road. Well, in that case, you don't want a grip. Nobody uses grips anymore. They're out of style. They're a back number. You want one of these. No, I don't. I want a grip. I've always used a grip. I don't like these newfangled bags. But I think you're mistaken. Everybody uses these bags nowadays. I don't care. Grips I... aren't any good. Not enough room in them. Can't keep your clothes right. Your suits get wrinkled. You'll carry an extra suit along with you, won't you? Yes, but... Well, in that case, this bag is just the thing. A place for everything and everything in its place. Accommodates every traveling need. This is what you want. No, it isn't. I want a grip. 
And if I can't get it here, I'll... You see, I got off on the wrong foot right away by contradicting the prospect. Mind you, you may be perfectly right in everything you say, but if you present it that way, well, prospects are pretty rugged individualists sometimes. How much better it would have been to handle it this way? Good day, sir. Well, how do you do? I'm looking for one of those uh, grips. I didn't see what I wanted in your window. One of those, uh, you know, grips. Yes, I understand. Of course. Going to do a little traveling, eh? Yep. I'm going on the road again. Here is a very nice grip. Genuine top green cowhide leather. Hand sewed. Lined with imported Irish linen. Will not scratch or soil. Yeah. Well. By the way, here's another style of bag with many new conveniences for a person who travels a lot. Well, I know. But it probably costs too much. It does cost a little more. But then the savings on suit pressings would in a short time more than pay for the difference. Well, I, I never thought about one of those. But you know, that looks all right. In other words, always be sure to show them what they ask for first. Yes. By not contradicting and getting off on the right track, you're well on the way to stepping the prospect up to a better sale, to what he really needs, and to having a better satisfied customer. All right, Ben, where do we go from here? What's rule number five? Rule number five is lose no time. Cut off all unnecessary actions. Let all things have their places. But let each part of your business have its time. Don't waste time, but tell a complete story? Right. Now suppose I'm selling a woman a refrigerator. I find out, by getting the prospect to talk, that she's interested in the ice tray. All right. You see, Mrs. Brown, a simple lift of this lever and the cubes are released instantly. The quick cube tray, it's called. Here, try it. Isn't it easy? Just a minute, Ben. You find out what the prospect is interested in by getting her to talk. But after you've sold her on that, what do you do then, Ben? Whip out the order book and go after the old signature? No, I don't do that. Oh, I give her an opportunity to buy, sure. But usually, if you do it too early in the sale, you'll find she'll hedge on you. Why? Because she's busy thinking up other things she's interested in. What are you driving at, Ben? Just this. I must tell a complete story. Not only must I sell her on the things she told me she was interested in, but I'm a seller on the other things she's interested in that she didn't tell me about. Maybe she didn't even think about it. If I'm a smart salesman, I anticipate these things. Consider the savings. Lifetime porcelain finish. No tugging, no hacking, no pride. Extra cold storage for ice cubes and meat. Full width sliding shelves. Hydrate for fruits and vegetables. Nine-way adjustable interior. Thermo-sealed cabin. The simplest refrigerating mechanism ever built. What you want is a refrigerator that'll give you all these things, Mrs. Brown. Now, what day would be convenient for you to have this model delivered to your home? Wednesday or Thursday? Well, I don't know. Wednesday, I go to the club. And Thursday, Thursday morning, I'll be home. But how much do I have to pay down? We'll arrange that to suit you, Mrs. Brown. 
How much would be convenient? Well, I don't know. Would $25 be all right? That'll be fine. Now, if you'll just okay this order, Mrs. Brown, we'll have it out to your house Thursday morning. And thank you. Thank you very much. A complete story gets the order, because you never know what particular feature is going to make the prospect definitely decide to buy. And unless you do tell a complete story, you may overlook the one feature that will turn the trick. One more thing, Ben, about that order. Does she always sign it? No. No, she doesn't. The salesman doesn't live who can close every deal. But I'll say this. If she goes out with my complete story in her mind, she's going to be a mighty tough prospect for any competitive salesman. Because if she goes out, she'll know a lot about my product. And that competitive salesman is going to be on the defensive every step of his contact. Okay, Ben, okay. Thank you very much. Those rules of yours sure do the job. They work just as well in today's job of selling America. Well, they should. After all, they're universal principles of human association. You see, they're broader than just selling alone. They apply to any and every matter of contact. They're the rules for a better relationship of man to man. And I feel that I can say this without seeming vain, for they weren't new with me, these rules. They're as old as history. I picked them up from salesmen who lived hundreds of years before my time. Get the prospect to talk. Ask questions. Don't argue. Answer with a yes, but. Don't contradict. Don't be too positive. Don't waste time, but tell a complete story. Use these five rules every day, in every contact, and you can sell America.